The boys of capital, they also chortle in their martinis about the death of socialism. The word has been banned from polite conversation, and they hope no one will notice that every socialist experiment of any significance in the 20th century, without exception, was either overthrown, invaded, corrupted, perverted, subverted, destabilized, or otherwise had its life made impossible for it by the United States and its allies. Not one socialist government or movement from the Russian Revolution to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, from communist China to the FMLN in El Salvador, not one was permitted to rise or fall solely on its own merits. Not one was left secure enough to drop its guard against the all-powerful enemy abroad and freely and fully relax control at home. It's as if the Wright brothers' first experiments with flying machines all failed because the automobile interests sabotaged each test flight. And then the good God-fearing folk of the world looked upon these catastrophes, nodded their heads wisely, and intoned solemnly, Humankind shall never fly. Instances of the United States overthrowing or attempting to overthrow a foreign government since the Second World War. China, 1949 to the early 1960s. Albania, 1949 to 1953. East Germany throughout the 1950s, Iran 1953, Guatemala 1954, Costa Rica mid 1950s, Syria 1956 to 1957, Egypt 1957, Indonesia 1957 to 1958, British Guiana 1953 to 1964, Iraq 1963. North Vietnam, 1945 to 1973, Cambodia, 1955 to 1970, Laos, 1958, 1959, and 1960, Ecuador, 1960 to 1963, the Congo, 1960, France, 1965, Brazil, 1962 to 1964, the Dominican Republic, 1963, Cuba, 1959 to present. Bolivia, 1964. Indonesia, 1965. Ghana, 1966. Chile, 1964 to 1973. Greece, 1967. Costa Rica, 1970 to 1971. Bolivia, 1971. Australia, 1973 to 1975. Angola, 1975. And again in the 1980s. Zaire, 1975. Portugal, 1974 to 1976. Jamaica, 1976 to 1980. Sequelas, 1979 to 1981. Chad, 1981 to 1982. Grenada, 1983. South Yemen, 1982 to 1984. Suriname, 1982 to 1984. Fiji. 1987, Libya, 1980s, Nicaragua, 1981 to 1990, Panama, 1989, Bulgaria, 1990, Albania, 1991, Iraq, 1991, Afghanistan, the 1980s, Somalia, 1993, Yugoslavia, 1999, it's 2000, Ecuador, 2000, Afghanistan, 2001, Venezuela, 2002, Iraq. 2003, Haiti, 2004, Somalia, 2007 to present, Honduras, 2009, Libya, 2011, Syria, 2012, Ukraine, 2014. This is Outrage News, also known as Captain Waffles, and today we'll be talking about United States imperialism since World War II. This video and following videos are slash will be based largely on the work of two scathing critics of U.S. foreign policy and the books of theirs I have on my shelf. Noam Chomsky, professor formerly at MIT and now Tucson, Arizona, and the late great William Bloom, former State Department employee turned political activist and author who passed away in December of 2018. William Bloom was probably one of the most hated people by the CIA 
and there is a good chance my name and picture are floating around in some leftist conspiracy list because I attended his celebration of life in Washington, D.C. in March of 2019. I took a bus. Don't do that. Buses are awful. Especially when it takes a day to get where you're going, just to be there for 17 hours, and then a day to get back home. But enough of my shenanigans. I've been wanting to make substantial videos for a while, so here I am. First, why only start after World War II when the United States started as an empire? George Washington, the guy on the $1 bill, infamously said that the United States was a, quote, infant empire. Well, I may very well get into the early history of the United States, but for now, I want to focus on the modern era for mainly two reasons. One, after World War II, there was a huge power vacuum and manufacturing vacuum that the United States filled like a Twinkie that gave the United States unparalleled power to shape the world order as it saw fit. And we're still dealing with a lot of those decisions today. You can't understand anything about the world without understanding power. And two, this just isn't covered anywhere. Unless you're a fucking weirdo like me who takes the time to read this shit, you just don't know about it. It's not talked about on the news, it's never mentioned by politicians, even awesome ones like Bernie Sanders, who will often skim over the United States' role in, say, the current immigration crisis that's happening right now. In Honduras, in 2009, the Obama administration orchestrated a coup that caused a lot of pain and strife, and it's a huge source of people coming across the border today. You fuck with people's homelands, you give them a choice between death and walking a thousand miles to the United States, and they're going to walk. This is all to say that this is important information for people to know when thinking about why things are happening the way they are. We have to trace back to the square root of the problem, or as they said back in the day, we have to be radical. Back then, radical just meant analyzing a problem from its root cause. Now it just means bad people I don't like. But I digress. Let's get started. 1945. China. For years, numerous Americans in high positions held the conviction that World War II was, quote, the wrong war against the wrong enemies, end quote. Was that not why Hitler had been ignored, tolerated, appeased, and aided? so that the Nazi war machine would turn east and wipe Bolshevism off the face of the earth once and for all? It was just unfortunate that Adolf turned out to be such a megalomaniac and turned west as well. But with the Nazis defeated, the United States was to have their way in every corner of the world. The ink on the Japanese surrender treaty was hardly dry when the U.S. began to use Japanese soldiers still in China alongside American troops, and a joint effort against Chinese communists. In the Philippines and in Greece, as we shall see, the United States did not even wait for the war to end before subordinating the struggle against Japan and Germany to the anti-communist crusade. The United States worked closely with Chinese communists during the war, and that changed almost instantly when Japan was defeated. Chinese General Chiang Kai-shek was functionally an appendage of the United States war machine. The Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, forerunner to the CIA, estimated the bulk of Chiang's military efforts had been directed against communists rather than the Japanese during the war, and now his forces containing Japanese units were to be used against the communist forces of Mao Zedong and Chu Enlai. President Truman at the time was upfront about what he described as using the Japanese to hold off the communists. And I quote, It was perfectly clear to us that if we told the Japanese to lay down their arms immediately and march to the seaboard, the entire country would be taken over by the communists. We therefore had to take the unusual step of using the enemy as a garrison until we could airlift Chinese national troops to South China and send the marines to guard the seaports." End quote. 
the United States airlifted between 400,000 and 500,000 Chinese national troops throughout China. Without the support, the Civil War would have been over shortly after the Japanese surrendered, maybe a few weeks at the most. But the deployment of United States Marines to strategic locations kept the Communist forces at bay, for a while at least. It's worth noting that the scene from Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor near the end of the movie where they crash land in China, that was based in reality. Chinese communists, as the New York Times wrote, quote, did not lose one airman taken under their protection. They made a point of never accepting rewards for saving American airmen, end quote. By 1946, there was 100,000 American military personnel in China supporting Chiang. With many troops beginning to protest and the communists fighting for their homeland against the invaders, it was clear that some kind of deal had to be made. China would not become an obedient client state as U.S. planners had wished it would. Truman sent General George Marshall to arrange a ceasefire and some kind of unspecified coalition government. While some temporary success was achieved in an on-and-off truce, the idea of a coalition government was doomed to failure, as unlikely as a marriage between the Tsar and the Bolsheviks. As the historian D.F. Fleming has pointed out, one cannot unite a dying oligarchy with a rising revolution. End quote. Not until early 1947 did the United States begin to withdraw some of its military forces, although aid and support to the Chiang government continued in one form or another long afterwards. By 1949, U.S. aid to the nationalists since the war amounted to almost $2 billion in cash and $1 billion worth of military hardware. 39 Nationalist Army divisions had been trained and equipped, yet the Chiang dynasty was collapsing all around in bits and pieces. It had not only been the onslaught of Chiang's communist foes, but the hostility of the Chinese people at large to his tyranny, his wanton cruelty, and the extraordinary corruption and decadence of his entire bureaucratic and social system. By contrast, the large areas under communist administration were models of honesty, progress, and fairness. Entire divisions of the Generalissimo's forces defected to the communists. American political and military leaders had no illusions about the nature and quality of Chiang's rule. The Nationalist Forces, said General David Barr, head of the military mission in China, were under, quote, the world's worst leadership, end quote. The Generalissimo, his cohorts, and soldiers fled to the offshore island of Taiwan. They had prepared their entry two years earlier by terrorizing the islanders into submission, a massacre which took the lives of as many as 28,000 people. Prior to the Nationalists' escape to the island, the U.S. government entertained no doubts that Taiwan was a part of China. Afterwards, uncertainty began to creep into the minds of Washington officials. The crisis was resolved in a remarkably simple manner. The U.S. agreed with Chiang that the proper way to view the situation was not that Taiwan belonged to China, but that Taiwan was China. And so it was called. In the wake of the communists' success, China scholar Felix Green observed, quote, Americans simply could not bring themselves to believe that the Chinese, however rotten their leadership, could have preferred a communist government, end quote. It must have been the handiwork of a conspiracy, an international conspiracy, at the control panel which sat, not unexpectedly, the Soviet Union. The evidence for this, however, was thin to the point of transparency. Indeed, ever since Stalin's credo of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, won out over Trotsky's internationalism in the 1920s, the Russians had sided with Chiang more than with Mao. 
advising the latter more than once to dissolve his army and join Chiang's government. Particularly in the post-World War II years, when the Soviet Union was faced with its own staggering crisis of reconstruction, did it not relish the prospect of having to help lift the world's most populous nation into the modern age? In 1947, General Marshall stated publicly that he knew of no evidence that the Chinese communists were being supported by the USSR. But in the United States, this did not prevent the rise of an entire mythology of how the U.S. had, quote, lost China, end quote. Soviet intervention, State Department communists, White House cowards, military and diplomatic folly, communist dupes and fellow travelers in the media, treachery everywhere. From 1949 all the way to the 1960s, the CIA continued to conduct raids and terrorism across China's borders wherever it was possible. If you want to know more about this period, I highly suggest reading Killing Hope by William Bloom. This video is largely based on the first chapter of that book, China. 1945 to the 1960s. But by 1949, the bulk of the action was done, and it was guerrilla terrorism from then on out, with the exception of the army that was being put together in Taiwan. But even at the probably exaggerated number of 10,000 men strong, it was clear that short of a full-on U.S. invasion, China was doomed to communism forever. If you thought this video was cool, please click the like button and subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you get notifications for when I upload videos. I plan to make a video for all US interventions since World War II, at the very least. If you thought this video was super duper cool, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash captainwaffles. Thank you.